Einstein had an extraordinary ability to combine what was thought before as separate concepts into new and usable concepts in physics. With Einstein's theories of relativity, he combined mass and energy, with his famous equation E equals mc squared, and he combined space and time into what is known as the space-time continuum. Before this it was believed objects only existed in three dimensions, but according to special relativity, time is no longer a measurement created by man to describe events throughout existence, but is inseparable from space, and vital to the construction of the universe. The addition of a fourth dimension of space-time results in black holes, wormholes, and time travel. Special relativity is based on two postulates which are contradictory in classical mechanics. The first is that the laws of physics are the same for all observers in uniform motion relative to one another, and the second is the speed of light in a vacuum is the same for all observers, regardless of their relative motion of the source of light. Basically, the second postulate contends the velocity of light is constant, and nothing can travel the speed of light. You can imagine the speed of light as a cosmic speed limit of 186,000 miles a second. Since you cannot travel the speed of light by increasing your speed relative to the velocity of light you would slow the rate time would pass. The defining feature of special relativity is the replacement of the Galilean transformations of classical mechanics by the Lorentz transformation equations. As a consequence of the Lorentz transformation equation of time dilation, as you approach a velocity close to the speed of light, not only will time tick slower, but your length would contract and your mass would increase. Since mass would increase, as you approach the velocity of light, one may question if the time in the universe alters in these two frames of reference, or if the increase in the object's mass simply caused the time on the clock to tick slower. Heat present in a room with a grandfather pendulum clock will cause the pendulum to expand and the time on the clock will tick slower. It wasn't the consistency of the speed of light that caused the time to dilate, it was the inconsistency of the pendulum's mass. Let's conduct a thought experiment. Imagine you have a twin and you and your twin are standing next to each other at a distance of three feet. Now, let's say that you shrink down to the mass of an ant. The amount of time it took you to shrink to this size was one second. Of course this is not possible with modern technology, but neither is traveling close to the speed of light. In your perspective, the distance between you and your twin now seems like it's close to 100 feet. You would have traveled roughly 100 feet in one second, so we can say that according to your perspective your velocity was near 100 feet per second. Now, let's say your evil twin attempts to stomp on you. In his perspective, the stomp only took one second, but you record the time as five seconds. Which twin is correct? This is obviously an example of time dilation. 100 feet a second is nowhere close to 186,000 miles a second. When you plug 100 feet a second into the Lorentz transformations, the outcome alleges there should be practically no time dilation. 100 feet a second is 68.18 miles an hour, you travel at this speed all the time. The fact remains that you have experienced time dilation regardless of the outcome of the Lorentz transformation equation. Since these equations are used to determine the covariance of the laws of physics, any change in their form requires a change in the efficiency of these laws. The only thing you needed to do was decrease your mass and you can conclude the speed of light had nothing at all to do with your perceived time dilation. By decreasing your mass you did not warp time in the universe and cause it to split into two different frames of reference, your measurements just became relative to the mass of the observer. Let's do another thought experiment that was suggested by Professor Herbert Dingle in his book Science at the Crossroads. According to the Einstein's theory of special relativity, if you have two exactly similar clocks, A and B, and one is moving with respect to the other, they must work at different rates, in effect, one works more slowly than the other. But the theory also requires that you cannot distinguish which clock is the moving one, it is equally true to say, that A rests while B moves, and that B rests while A moves. The question therefore arises, how does one determine, consistently with the theory, which clock works the more slowly? Unless the question is answerable, the theory unavoidably requires that A works more slowly than B and B more slowly than A which it requires no superintelligence to see is impossible. The question is left to the mathematical specialists who either ignore it or shroud it in various obscurities. 
The only person I have found that did put this debate to the test mathematically is Ard Shermata. If you would like to see his results you can Google the Emperor's new clothes. His conclusion was one would have to jettison either the Lorentz transformations or the theory of relativity or both. And since special relativity is dependent upon both of these, without them, Einstein's special theory of relativity would need revision. The only possible way to determine which clock is moving and which clock is at rest is to determine which clock experienced length contraction and an increase of its initial mass. For the Infiniverse theory of relativity I will replace Einstein's second postulate and add time dilation is relative to a significant increase or decrease in mass, which is similar to Newton's law of inertia and is compatible with classical mechanics. I can hear the physicists now, who are you to disprove Einstein based on thought experiments alone? This is a good point, so I developed an experiment that anyone can do to verify the Infiniverse postulate. The hypothesis is that a change of mass is due to resistance, and the higher the velocity of an object the more resistance it will experience. An example would be hitting water at relativistically high velocity, you would experience a change of length and mass similar to traveling at a velocity close to the speed of light in space. Synchronize two stopwatches and place one on the dash of your car, and one between the headlights in front of your car so that the stopwatch in front of the car will experience more resistance. Since these two stopwatches are stationary, they would travel the same speed and distance relative to one another, and the only variable is the amount of resistance each watch will experience. Travel 30 minutes on the highway with an average velocity of 70 miles per hour, then travel 30 minutes back to your house maintaining the same velocity. According to special relativity, there should not be any time difference between these two clocks, because they were traveling at the same velocity relative to one another, but according to the Infiniverse theory of relativity the clock that experienced more resistance would tick slower than the clock without resistance. When you compare the two times, the watch that was subjected to more resistance will always be slower than the watch on your dash. The time dilation between these two watches had nothing to do with the velocity of light. The outcome of this experiment also supports evidence that an object with a velocity close to the speed of light in space will experience length contraction and an increase of mass because of the resistance of ether. If space were nothingness, there would be no explanation for length contraction and an increase of mass in the first place. You have to remember that Einstein himself could not believe that his theory of relativity could lead to singularities and black holes. We have length height, width and instead of the fourth dimension being space-time you can now extract time from space and place it into mass and mass becomes the true fourth dimension of reality. What is the purpose of having length, height, and width anyways, if you do not use them to measure mass? Since space and time are no longer combined it contradicts Einstein's theory of gravity also. I discuss the solution for gravity in detail in section 3 of this video. In this next section I unify the micro and macrocosmos. Einstein said that he spent his whole life trying to understand the nature of light. He spent the last two decades of his life trying to unify electromagnetism with gravity to develop a unified field theory of the fundamental forces of nature. In his special theory of relativity he claimed the speed of light in a vacuum is constant, but recent research indicates electromagnetic radiation of higher frequencies may in fact travel faster than those of lower frequencies in a vacuum. It is also believed that the mass of a photon, which is an individual quanta of light, is zero, because according to the, the Lorentz transformations of special relativity, any mass traveling at the speed of light would become infinite. Everyone knows these equations in physics are correct, and one can determine the mass of a photon with them, but physicists still insist to this day, that because of special relativity, the photon must have zero mass. The classical view of the photon traveling as a wave has been reformed in modern physics to that resembling a helix, and to make things even more unusual about the nature of the photon, it seems to have the characteristics of both a wave and a particle known as wave-particle duality. So. What the heck is the nature of light?